Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the next session on basics of video technology. So, last time we stopped just before quantization. Um, so, this is basically what comes after downsampling of our um, video signal, for instance, for the color components, um, the prominence. So, let me look at quantization, we have to make sure that we avoid quantization artifacts in coding. And in general, um, we find that about 20 brightness changes in a small area in a complex image are sufficient to avoid artifacts. But, so this basically was um, found out um, using um, tests with people and showing them different ray levels and see if they can distinguish different ray levels, but not side by side. So when you put ray le different ray levels side by side, then you can find you need more levels, about 100 grayscale level levels, to avoid artificial edges or artificial contours where one level jumps to the next level. Right? So 100 means about seven bits per pixel, um, so that should be sufficient um, for quantization. But in general, we have um, bytes in a computer, which is 8 bits. So that's why um, in video, in general, we use 8 bits for the levels. So if we have a grayscale image, we encode it using 8 bits, meaning grayscale uh, values from 0 to 100 to 255. Or if we have um, color images, then those three color components are quantized using um, those 8-bit um, representations with recording quantization step sizes. So here's a reference to it. So this leads us then to the next set of slides. So number five. <coughs> Yeah, so we saw um, we have in the encoder the low pass filtering and downsampling, and in the decoder we have this insertion of pixels in the correct positions and then low pass filtering to obtain the original size. Right. So the question is now how do we design our low pass filters? Right. What frequencies are passed? and which ones are to be blocked or attenuated. So for that we can again take a look at the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, and it generates um, our DFT coefficients, x of k, where k is the subband index, from our signal x of n, for instance a row of luminance uh, y at pixel position n, so we should call this row. Yeah, and these indices are also called subband indices. And the uh, um, x of k are called subband signals for k fixed. So what is the meaning of the different frequency indices k? Right, when we apply the DFT, we have k going from 0 to capital N minus 1, where n is the length of our DFT. So when we look at k equals 0, this corresponds to the lower spatial frequency, basically everything that's constant um, in our signal. So in this case it's constant over n samples, for instance, of our row. Yeah, and the indices of our spatial frequencies run in the same range, also from 0 to strictly less than capital N. And we also saw that the DFT coefficients are actually symmetric about their center. Right? So basically, you have this mirror symmetry from the lower half to the upper half. So this center is at k equals n over 2. Right? 
So this actually corresponds to a sequence in the spatial domain for the brightness change which with changing signs. So if you have a signal which is, for instance, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, so each pixel has the opposite sign, or um, when we have images, we don't have negative values. So here we could say one pixel is bright, the next pixel is dark, then bright, then dark again. So then we have the highest possible frequency when bright and dark pixels um, one after the other, which if, if it switches from one to the next one. So then we have the maximum rate of change, and this is called the Nyquist frequency. So what we have in the middle uh, of our DFT frequency domain is the Nyquist frequency. Yeah, and then we have the sampling frequency. So the coefficients not calculated by the DFT with index K equals capital N corresponds to the sampling frequency. So this is basically our pixel frequency. So if we would have a rate of change, which would mean one period per pixel, then we would have um, our sampling rate. So the sampling rate is then the same as the pixel rate. Yeah, this means we cannot distinguish a signal with one period per sampling after sampling from a constant signal. And uh, yeah, that's, that means this coefficient would be identical to the coefficient at DC. So x of capital N is x equals zero. So imagine you have a signal, uh, very fine lines. Right? You have a line, black, white, black, white. And you only sample at the white lines. So each pixel happens to be on the one white lines then what you have at the, outside, at the output of your camera is all white. You don't see the black lines in between because, that's what, because you're not sampling there. Right? And that's why um, a signal which has the same rate of change as our sampling rate, the pixel rate, appears to us like a constant. Make sense? So that's why basically this coefficient x of capital N is the same as x of zero. So basically this fits to the symmetry. When we look at the symmetry everything is mirrored about the center and that means also dc appears on the opposite side and the opposite side in this case is x of n. So it fits to this symmetry. Yeah, and this again shows that Nyquist frequency is half the sampling frequency. Right? Nyquist frequency we saw is right in the middle. And this is n over 2, capital N over 2, and the sampling rate is n. So that means sampling frequency is twice the Nyquist frequency. Make sense? Did you have that in signals and systems already? No? Okay, so this is something important to remember because this comes up at every system where you do sampling. You have a sampling frequency and half the sampling frequency is the Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency is basically the upper limit of our usable frequency range. Because we saw above Nyquist it repeats. Right? We have this symmetry, this mirror symmetry around Nyquist. So we have frequencies from zero to Nyquist then they repeat from this mirror symmetry and that means everything up to Nyquist is our useful frequency range and basically what's above is repetition. Yeah, and this is basically also the famous Nyquist sampling theory which uh, basically says we can um, reconstruct frequencies up to but not including the Nyquist sampling rate, uh, the Nyquist frequency. So, and the Nyquist frequency is half the sampling frequency. So, yeah, so this is an um, important principle to remember. And this basically also shows up at, um, say, um, audio sampling. When you have a CD, an audio CD, these are sampled at 44.0 kHz sampling rate. And that means our audio signal. Uh, 
can be reconstructed only up to 20.05 um, kilohertz. It's half the sampling rate, but not including light. So that's why your audio frequencies are limited to 22 kilohertz in this case. Yeah, so here I have a little iPython example for selecting the filter. So let's take our vector x of n containing 32 pixels in this example. So it's kind of a short image. So that means capital N equals 32. And we want to downsample it by the factor of um, capital M equals 4. Right? So that's kind of realistic. So we saw that by downsampling in the decoder, periodics or periodic continuations of the spectrum became visible, uh, which we must suppress by our filter. So these are the aliasing, um, aliasing. So this was aliasing or moray. Yeah. So. First, let's try it with our DC signal, so kind of uncritical, right? The lowest possible frequency, so we don't really expect many problems. So that should be easy. So the DC signal here in this case consists of 32 watts, right? A constant brightness over um, this row of pixels. So then we downsample it. Here we initialize the downsample, the zeros, and then we copy every fourth sample of our signal. Here, the ones. Right? So we just take the samples from 0 to 32 and jump by four indices. Then we plot it to set the axis to useful scales. Then we plot the downsampled version, give it a title and labels, and this is what we get. So this is kind of what we expect, right? So here we can see horizontally, we have the index, the pixel index n. Vertically, we have the value of the original and the downsampled version. And you can see here in blue, we have the original, and in green, we have the downsampled signal. And you can see, we start at the zero sample with down sample. So we keep the zeros, then we keep uh, sample number four, and so on. So every fourth sample we keep, and everything in between is zero. So again, the lines here are generated from the plot function because it just connects dots, right? it draws lines between dots. So this is an artifact from the plot function. Yeah, now we can apply the DFT to um, the original signal and then to the downsampled version. So here we can see we apply FFT.FFT. .FFT. So FFT is the library, and in it we have the FFT function, and we give it X as an argument, and then we plot the magnitude again with nice labels. And here you can see indeed only. Um, the index k equals zero has a non-zero output. So indeed, we have some DC. So this analysis shows us we have DC in our picture, a constant level. So this was to expect. Right? So that makes sense. So we have a peak at index k equals zero. So now we look at the DFT of the downsampled versions. the DCT of the downsampled. So same thing as before, just now we have XDS, the downsampled version, and the resulting plot looks like this. So now we see we have three additional peaks. Is this what, this what you expected? So remember when we had the camera last time and we did the downsampling, when I hit the key 
as we have the downsampling, and we have, we have those uh, copies, those spectral copies. Right? And this is basically what happens here too. Here, those three extra lines are now spectral copies um, appearing basically um, at the downsampling rate that we have here. So basically, we have a lower sampling rate. So the old sampling rate was, uh, was 32. So we have 32 samples per line. Now we have one quarter of it. So the new sampling rate is 32 by, divided by eight, uh, by four, and that would be eight, right? So basically now eight samples per line is our new sampling rate. And this is also why we get this next peak here. Um, eight samples from the first one. Right. So this original peak stays, then we have another one at our new sampling rate, eight. And remember, sampling rate and DC is the same in the DCT, in the DFT domain. So this is then our new sampling rate here, and then we have basically harmonics of our new sampling rate. So we have peaks at 16, 32, and so on. So here actually 32 is not part of the DFT anymore, and that's why we don't see this uh, peak at 32. Makes sense? So this basically happens because now we have a new lower sampling rate. Instead of 32 pixels per line or per row, we only have 8 pixels per line or per row as, as our new sampling rate. Yeah, so here the other peaks are the periodic continuations of our original. So this is what we must suppress, suppress now. So we suppress that um, before we do the downsampling and after we do the upsampling. So we, we see that we can do this by setting the coefficients of the local frequencies with the indices from 8 to uh, 24 to zeros. So this is basically our low pass filter. Okay. So now we can test this signal with the higher frequency and apply the downsampling. So now instead of DC, we now apply a sinusoid, so a bright dark change. So here you can see we have a bright dark change of frequency 2 pi divided by 32 times 3. So basically three periods over this width of our row. And then we can do the downsampling as before, plot the original, plot the downsampled. And this is what we get. And so the blue one is now our test signal with higher frequency. So here you can see it goes up to 1, down to minus 1, and so on. For images, uh, you would actually add a minus 1 to avoid negative uh, values. But it doesn't really matter because just adding um, plus one would be adding a DC value. So that doesn't really change anything for this frequency. Yeah, so the green one is then what remains after downsampling. So you can see what remains is just peaks. So one positive peak, one negative peak, and zeros in between. Right. So this looks much less than, than a sinusoid. It's just changing peaks up and down. So then the DFT of the original signal, we just apply the, uh, the FFT again and plot the magnitude. So this is the result of the DFT from the original. 
So here you can see we had three periods over our range of our row or line. And indeed we have a peak now at index frequency index three. Right? So this corresponds to the frequency three periods per line. And of course the same mirror on the other side, because we know that we have this mirror symmetry. So now we can take the same for downsampled version. Right, so here we take the FFT of the downsampled version and plot it again. And this is what we get. Interesting, right? So why don't we have those pairs now all of a sudden? Any idea? That's interesting, right? So again, keep in mind that we do the same downsampling by a factor of four. That means the new sampling rate is um, eight, right? Eight pixels per this line. So basically, we have the original, which was the one at three, and then we have um, the one at three here, and also the one. Um, I think the last one, just before 30, I guess. I'm not sure. To check it. Yeah, so the last one is 29. So we have two peaks, and those peaks are now shifted by multiples of 8 and added to the original. So that means this one here, number 3, we add 8. What do we, what do we get? 11, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this one here. Then we also do the same here with this last one. We have 29 plus 8 is how much? 37. Yeah, 37. But 37, basically we have this wrap around from the beginning. So basically 37 minus 32 is how much? 5. 5, right. And indeed, it is this one here. Right. So this, this peak here actually came from this last one by wrapping around. So similar for the other ones, the R result from shifts of 8, of multiples of 8, because well, that's our new sampling rate. Yeah, and that's also why we have pairs, and here you can also see that they come dangerously close, right? What happens if the original and the alias copy overlap? Any idea? No? It is not possible anymore to reconstruct the original image of values. Yes, exactly. Right. So here we can still reconstruct the original by filtering. Right. Imagine the first and the last peak are the originals. So we can re uh, remove the remaining peaks by low pass filtering because they are still separate. But an increase. Any small increase of this frequency would lead to an overlap of the original and the alias copies, and we could not separate them using filtering anymore. So that means we could not reconstruct. So this shows here, this is basically as far as we can go with our frequency for this downsampling rate. So actually the sinusoid that we took here is basically the maximum that we can afford for this downsampling rate. After this, any, any higher, you would get overlap, and it would be impossible to reconstruct the original. So this basically gives us a rule for um, yeah, how much filtering we need. Right? So any frequency components above this, we would need to remove before downsampling. Otherwise, we get artifacts after reconstruction. Yeah, so here we see the first peak at k equals 3 and the last peak of at k equals 29. They are the original and the others are periodic continuations and do not belong to the original. So that means we now must set those coefficients from 5 to 27 to 0. So this is now the stop band of our filter 
the desired stop end. Yeah, so this is actually now a bigger area than for DCT or Lopez filter with a lower cutoff frequency because this is the more critical case. Right? DC is not really so difficult. Yeah, so here you can see that the spectral continuations, the ADC, move towards each other compared to DC. And that's because this last peak wraps around. And that's why they effectively move towards each other. So we increase the frequency of our signal and the frequency of the first spectral continuation moves downward. If we increase the frequency of our sinusoidal signal a little more to a frequency which corresponds to index k equals 4, then original and spectral continuation overlap and um, we cannot separate them anymore. So we would destroy our signal. It would be unrecoverable. Yeah, so here's an example what happens, how sampling can destroy a signal. So this is the case of, again, downsampling M equals 4. And now we have a frequency of 4 periods. So a sinusoid which has 4 up-downs over our row. And then we can downsample it. And this is what we get after downsampling. Can you see what happens after downsampling this sinusoid of four periods? Can you see those numbers? Do we have any numbers unequal zero? Which ones? The second one. 3.67 times 10 to the minus 16. Are you familiar with the floating point notation? E minus 16. What does E minus 16 mean? So this is also what you see in um, scientific pocket calculators, right? You have this E minus something, that means times 10 to the minus something. So here, if you have something E minus 16, it means times 10 to the minus 16th. So how big is 10 to the minus 16th? That is zero point and then fifteen zeros. Right? All right, yeah. Right. So if you have ten to the minus one, it's point one. If you have ten to the minus two, it's point oh one. So you have one zero um, after the comma. And in this case, we have fifteen zeros after the comma. So it's tiny. And this actually comes from the limited uh, computational accuracy of Python. Python has an accuracy of about 10 to the minus 16. And that means what we see here is basically inaccuracies from the numerics of Python. So if you see values on the order of 10 to the minus 16, then you know those numbers are probably zero. Right? Rounding errors. Yeah. So here you can see our dis signal was destroyed, right? Before it was sinusoidal, four periods up and down between minus one and one. And after sampling, we have a sequence of zeros. Right? So basically this is because now the peak of um, the original at k equals four and the spectral, con uh, spectral aliasing will also appear at k equals 1. So basically the last one wraps around and falls exactly on k equals 4. And they have opposite signs. And they cancel each other. Right. So this is an example where um, the original spectral peak and the peak from the spectral copies 
they appear at the same frequency and they have opposite sign and hence they cancel and nothing is left. So here our signal was totally destroyed. Right. So this is what we want to avoid. We don't want to avoid our signal. And here you can easily see that there's nothing we can do. Right? Our signal is gone. And once it's gone, it's gone. We cannot recover it. Yeah. So that is because uh, the sine function was already too high for our new sampling rate. And this is because the sinusoid is exactly at the Nyquist frequency for our new sampling rate. And remember, our new sampling rate is 8 pixels per line, and the sinusoid here was 4 periods per line, so it's exactly half the sampling rate. Right, so this is exactly at um, the Nyquist frequency and Nyquist is not recoverable, only up to Nyquist. Nyquist itself is not recoverable for mm -hmm. Nyquist frequency. Yeah, and this means uh, for low pass filter, so I should call this low pass filter, these. You should set the coefficients of indices 4 to 28 to 0. Yeah, so this is also our summary here. Our examples show we can generally suppress um, the spectral continuations or aliasing with a low pass filter, which sets the coefficients or subbands of indices 4 to 28 to 0. But this also means that we can no longer transmit signals in the range of these spatial frequencies. Our signal can only have spatial frequencies strictly smaller than this index 4. So strictly smaller than Nyquist. You know, and you can see that it's Nyquist when you put this into relation um, to the sampling frequency. You know, so the sampling frequency here is k equals n equals 32. Our downsampling rate was m equals 4. So our system can only transmit signals with spatial frequencies strictly smaller than the cutoff frequency n divided by 2m equals 4. And this is our new Nyquist frequency. So which is the old Nyquist frequency n over 2 divided by the downsampling rate n equals 2. Right. Makes sense? So the old Nyquist frequency was kappa n over 2. The new Nyquist frequency is reduced by this downsampling rate of kappa n. Yeah. Right, so here is the new lower um, sampling frequency kappa n divided by Yeah, so here again as a formula, k, our subband index, needs to be strictly smaller than this um, new Nyquist frequency, which here I call fg, which is fa on the sampling frequency divided by 2. Yeah, and because of the symmetry, we also need to do the same for the upper end of our DFT index range. So that means here capital N minus this number here. So because that's also where we have the low frequencies, right? We have to keep the symmetry between two ends. Yeah, so altogether um, in the range of um, Fa divided by 2 and n minus Fa divided by 2, uh, we, need, we need to set those coefficients to 0. And remember, Fa was the new sampling frequency. Yeah, that means our signal frequency must be strictly smaller. So we should call this strictly smaller. And 
half of our new sampling frequency. You know, and this is also called the sampling theorem after Shannon Nyquist or simply Nyquist. Yeah, and that's why we call half the sampling frequency um, the Nyquist frequency. So this is something you should keep in mind because this, this is one of the most fundamental relations in digital signal processing. Yeah, and then since we now have those indices, um, it makes sense to talk about normalized frequencies where we're basically independent of the size of the DFT. Right here, we were always getting numbers in the range of zero to capital N minus one, and um, Nyquist accordingly was half of it. So. It's usually more convenient to talk about normalized frequency, to make it independent of the DFT size or um, the size of our image. So we normalize it such that 2 pi corresponds to the sampling frequency. So 2 pi would correspond to capital N in our case of the DFT. So the length of our DFT is normalized to 2 pi. Pi corresponds then to the Nyquist frequency. It's half of it. And we call capital omega the normalized frequency. Just to show that this is the normalized frequency, we give it a separate letter. Instead of K, we call it capital of omega. Capital omega. Yeah, and that means we can obtain normalized frequency by just dividing by the sample rate here, capital N, and multiply it by 2 pi. Right. So if 2 pi corresponds to our higher sample rate, then the pass band of our low pass filter before down sampling in equation 1 is hence simply this equation here. So we have our stop band in the range of minus pi over n to plus pi over n. And this negative uh, um, frequency is basically the upper half of our DFT. Right? Since it repeats, we can also say we have negative frequencies. And this looks nicer if we just um, say minus pi over n instead of um, 2 pi or uh, minus pi over n. Let's see, oh yeah, this is the past net. So this is what we want to keep, and outside of this range, we want to stop or discard the frequencies. Right? And here, omega is k divided by n times 2 pi. Does that make sense? So here yeah, it's fairly simple, right? Pi is our Nyquist frequency. If we reduce the sampling frequency by a factor of n, we accordingly reduce the Nyquist frequency to pi over n. Um, pi over n. So that means to be prepared for this down sampling, we just need to low pass filter our signal such that it doesn't contain any frequencies larger or equal to pi over n. And this is true for both ends for on both ends of the DFT, right? the one around zero and then the one around capital N. And this is reflected by the negative range here. So the negative is basically the upper half of our DFT. Make sense? Yeah, so here we now have a little Python example on a real video. 
So here we have the video signal with C equals 640 columns and R equals 480 rows. So this is our typical VGA format that we get from our webcam. And um, yeah, so the DFT or FFT generates correspondingly many coefficients um, of the spatial frequencies. And then we take a down sampling factor again of m equals 4 for horizontally and vertically. So the new sampling frequency over the columns along the rows is c divided by m. So here one row has c pixels. We down sample by 4, m equals 4. So that means the new sampling rate is c divided by m. And for the columns, we have R pixels vertically, right? And after downsampling, we have the frequency of R divided by M. Yeah. So. Then our low pass filter along the rows must set the DFT coefficients to zero with indices in this range. We have. Um, Sampling rate, uh, sampling frequency horizontally divided by two, and <coughs> this new sampling frequency was c divided by m. So this is what we get, or c divided by eight since m was four. So that's the result for the low end of the DC, DFT. And this C minus C divided by A is the upper end, basically the negative frequencies, uh, which we want to keep. And hence, uh, we get the range between C over 8 to C minus C over 8 as our stop end. For our stop end. the same along the columns. We get this formula here. It basically looks the same. We just replace C by R. So this must be set to zero for the stop end. Yeah, this is what we then can see in the Python script. Video FFT 0 I FFT resample Y. Um, so, this is basically taking the video, converts it to the y coefficient, the y component, the, um, um, the luminance, applies the FFT to it, sets those coefficients to zero, then applies the inverse FFT, and it's doing the resampling. So, it uses this, this mask for the filtering in the DFT domain. Here we can see MR for the rows. Here we can see the same uh, formula here. And we can see the mask in this range will be zero for our stop end. And then for the rows, instead of R, we have C, same thing. And together, we put those again together with uh, a matrix product. So dot, remember, was a matrix product. We have MR as a column vector and MC as a row vector. And that means from those two vectors we get now a matrix. Right. So each row consists of um, the mask MC multiplied by the entry of R. Right. Remember we get those um, um, the mask where we have the corners are one and everything in between is zero. And remember in those demos we had the corners being the active ones where we had those white lines or white um, um, signals and in the middle there was not much going on. But if there was something going on it was causing aliasing. And that's why we wanted to set the middle to zero. Yeah, and then we can apply 
the DFT and the inverse DFT. So maybe I show you again this little example here, which you already saw last time. Here you can see the program. So here you can again see that it opens our video card here with cap video capture. Here it reads the first frame to see the number of rows and columns. Here it puts some, some text in the first window, and here we have our infinite loop that reads from our camera and here we then do the con conversion to the Y component of the luminance to have a ray scale or black and white image and here we show the original the black and white plus the text which then tells you how to use it and here it's doing the filtering if we hit the key F right if filter on is true then we can see here we first apply the FFT, then we multiply the result with our mask, and then we inverse um, EFT, we apply the inverse FFT to it, and get um, the Y component back. And again, here I'm using the apps to avoid complex values, right, to have real values for the display. Here, similar for the sampling, here we can see if sampling is on using the key S, so if the flag sampling on is true, then we only keep every nth sample. So in this program you can also change the n to see how it looks like, so the n is not really fixed. You can change it. Yeah, and here it's telling you what it's doing using this text here. doing the 2D FFT here using the DS for the synthesis part and again filters here for the synthesis part and if sampling is on it also multiplies its scales to avoid um, disappearing energy and then it shows here in the decoder here it shows um, the DFT domain and here it shows the reconstructed image. And here it's doing the keyboard um, control. So here it um, gets the keyboard input in key. Key is the variable which contains the ASCII code of the key that was pressed. And then we just have to compare it to the key, ASCII codes of the ones that we want to have for control. So here ORT means it takes the ASCII code of this letter. So ORT of S means the ASCII code of S. And if the input key is the ASCII code of S, then we toggle this sampling on flag. Do you know what toggling means? So if it's false, it becomes true. If it's true, it becomes false. Same for filtering. Here is the key F. And for the key Q, we break, we end. So then we can actually try it out. So Python 3. Yes. So here you can see the original the decoded, and here is the DFT domain. So we're very instructional to see those patterns and what happens to the aliasing. So again, I have this pattern here. And then you can see here those white dots 
these represent the high frequencies. Right? So then I can just turn sampling on. And here you can see this is sampling without any low pass filtering. And that's why the reconstructed image only shows dots at the sampling instances or the sampling points. So again, I can use my pattern here. And you can see here, I have those spectral continuations. And they multiply. It's kind of hard to see, right? So now those high frequencies, they repeat accordingly and create more artifacts. It's not it's kind of dim, right? So can you see those those wavy lines? I can see see them quite clearly on my laptop, but maybe on the projector it's not so clear. So now we can turn on the filtering. So this is now filter on, and you see the reconstructed all of a sudden looks much better. Right? So this shows we are successful with more or less reconstructing the image except for some wavy lines here at the, at the edges, like here no, and here on the board. Can you see those wavy edges? So these are the ringing artifacts, right? So these are artifacts from filtering. So if I now try my trick with the uh, high frequencies, so here you can see now high frequencies as dots coming up. It's still reconstructing. So still reconstructing and now low pass filtering kicks in and the high frequencies disappear. Can you see it? So reconstructed is only a gray surface. It doesn't contain fine patterns anymore. And this is the purpose of low pass filtering. We want to remove those high frequencies that can create aliasing. Uh, we want to remove it before or remove them before they create um, trouble or artifacts. Right. So now I can set Q and then uh, we're done. So this is our resulting um, system. We have our signal X. We apply a low pass filter, in this case using our DFT and our mask. Then we do the sampling down sampling, up sampling, here, and then um, we transmit the down sampled version without the zeros, right? We only transmit the non zero coefficients or samples, and then with the receiver, we have up sampling, meaning we reinsert the zeros between the samples to blow up the image to the original size. We don't want to make it smaller. And then we use low pass filtering to create a smooth image, which is not only consisting of pixels separated by zeros, but uh, with smooth surfaces, as we just saw. So this again should be the ideal low pass. And Nyquist tells us if we have an ideal low pass, then the low pass filtered version is identical to um, the rec reconstructed. So here there's E which is the reconstructed after the receiver, should be identical to this S, which is after the low pass of the transmitter. So if we have this ideal low pass filter signal, we can perfectly reconstruct it, despite sampling. That's basically the guarantee that uh, the Nyquist theorem tells us. Right. So basically this is the same as we just saw with the spectral continuations or the spectral copies in the DFT domain. If those, co if those copies don't overlap, we can apply ideal filtering to get rid of the alias components or the spectral copies. Right? And if this is the case, if we get rid of them and don't change the original spectral components, we have our original signal back. Right? And that's basically what the Nyquist theorem tells us. If we have ideal filters, we are able to remove those spectral copies because when we have a low pass filter signal or a low pass, an ideal low pass like this, we have no overlap and we can reconstruct the original. Yeah.
But what if the signal S is not digital, where the filters are easy to build, but analog? Right. So, so far we got an already digitized signal from the camera. But think about the camera itself. Right. The camera has a lens, it projects on a CCD chip, for instance, and it has a discrete um, light sensitive um, cells. So it's already sampling on this chip. Right? There's already this first sampling going on. So here, video camera with its pixels, or when we have analog cameras, the lines or rows. Or on the other end, um, the monitor, the display. We have discrete pixels on the monitor. Right? Or when you have an analog monitor, we have the lines or rows. Same problem. So, strictly speaking, we would need to apply a low pass filter after our display. Right? So, what do you think? How, how do we do the low pass filtering after a display? Like, for instance, here this projector. When you, when you come close, you actually can see the individual pixels. How is it done in this case? Are you happy with an image from the projector? Yeah, more or less. Can you see the individual pixels? So why can't you see the individual pixels? You can't see them because spatial frequency of the image that we perceive from this distance is larger than what our eye can resolve. Yeah, exactly. When you think about the contrast sensitivity function, it has this low pass characteristic. Right? The higher the frequencies, the less sensitive it became. So basically, in this case, on the display, your eye itself has a built in low pass filter. Right? We saw it with those receptive fields. Those receptive fields are basically low pass filters. Right? So here, in this case, we don't need to really worry about um, implementing a low-pass filter because our eyes already have low-pass filters built in. So that's convenient for designs to, of such system. You can take into account that the eye, at least at a certain distance, has this low-pass filter built in. Which is no longer true if I'm, say, very close and I see individual pixels, because then those pixels appear at much lower spatial frequency. So for design for such systems, you have to take into account the viewing distance and the size of the display. Yeah. So the camera often has no low-pass filter. Right? And there, um, you, you might get problems if the image contains higher spatial frequencies. Right? So if you have, like in my case, um, if you have a camera and you have a very fine pattern, then actually it can, um, can happen that you get more ray artifacts. Yeah. So possible solution here would be to blur the camera slightly, or better to have an op optical uh, pre-filter or low-pass filtering. Or stage designing shows costumes uh, so that there would be no fine pattern in the image. So if you have like a jacket with very fine stripes or shirt with very fine stripes um, and you're in the studio, you could tell those people to not use those. Right? That's easy. Yeah, so aliasing cannot be removed afterwards, but it can be avoided if we take care that the image does not contain high spatial frequencies before the sampling. Yeah. And actually this optical pre-filtering is, is also done in, in good cameras. We have like uh, certain optics which basically spread one pixel, the light going to one pixel over the neighboring pixels. So you indeed sometimes have those optical low-pass filters built in. Yeah, and this sampling theorem can basically also be applied um, 
to the display and using the contrast sensitivity function. So this is basically what people did in the design of the television system in Europe and America. They needed to, design, to decide how many rows or how many lines to use. And, and for that, they can take into account the contrast sensitivity function. So here you can see this is the low-pass filter function of the eye. Horizontally, we have the spatial frequency. Vertically, you have the sensitivity of the eye. And you can see here, going to higher frequencies, higher spatial frequencies, meaning more lines per degree, um, get less sensitivity so that this has a low pass characteristic. Yeah. So usually it's done on the logarithmic scale. Here you can see the frequency, um, the periods per degree or cycles per degree on the logarithmic scale and here you have the sensitivity which means down here is high con and you need high contrast and up here you need low contrast. You can also see it, it changes slightly in shape when we have different brightnesses. So here those different colored dots means different brightness of the light. So actually the shape changes somewhat. Yeah, so we see that we don't have a perfect ideal low pass filter. So that's different from what Nyquist actually uh, demands. So here we already have to cut back on our uh, expectations. So instead of having an ideal filter, we have a slow drop in sensitivity um, to high frequencies. Right? So we need to take this into account. So that we must dimension or design our monitor in such a way that the eye is already sufficiently insensitive at half the sampling frequency or half the pixel frequency and that the eye should not be able to perceive uh, the line grid or pixel grid. Yeah, so just below this frequency, the eye is still relatively insensitive, cannot really be used for information transmission at these spatial frequencies. So first we want to make sure the eye does not see the pixel bit. Okay. But then, if you have somewhat larger pattern than the pixel grid, the eye is still not very sensitive, so we cannot really use it for, um, for our images. So the range of uh, range usable for transmission ends much earlier than the range from when, than the range of high attenuation begins, which means we have a transition band, a kind of safety distance between the pass band and the stop band. Okay, so this is this part where the slope goes down. Yeah, so the assumption we take is that the screen or display is sharp and lets you see individual lines or pixels at close viewing distance. And thus we need the transfer function of the eye for different spatial frequencies for the estimation of our cutoff frequency or for our low pass of the eye. Yeah, so here you see the effect of this non-perfect low pass. So, low frequencies have no problem. They are basically passed without change near the first row. Then in the middle range, you see that it already attenuates somewhat, this non-perfect low pass filter. So it's like in between passing and stopping. Right? And then at high frequencies, we have a good attenuation. So here at the R point, you see only a little bit ripple. So here you have a high attenuation. So this is what we basically have in our eye. It's not suddenly stop, stopping, but it has this um, slow um, um, increase of attenuation. So this is basically what we have here in our eye. Here this curve is for luminance. And we have to decide what we define as the passband. So actually here in this example, 
I took this here, so up to about 0.02 or 0.03 as a pass band. Here, this is the end of the pass band. And then I took this here at 0.001 as the beginning of the stop band. Right? And in between, you have the transition band. So here, this range here is the transition band, or also called safety distance. So from there on, here in this range, we have the stop band, practic practically no um, transmission above um, this frequency, and this is about 32 pixels per degree. Can you change this one? Can you get up that please? Yeah. Does that make sense? So up to the first line, from the lowest frequencies to up to about 30 periods per degree, we have a pass band. Then we have a transition band, which is in between passing and stopping, which goes from 30 to 43 periods per degree. As you can see here, this range here, this transition band, is here. Then, starting at about 43 periods per degree, we have a stop band. Then it's stopping. So, let me put it like that. Stop band. Make sense? So here we define those two boundaries. First the end of the pass band, the next one is between transition band and stop band. And this turns, turns out to be crucial for the design of television systems. This difference between end of pass band and beginning of stop band. Yeah, so this transition band appears between about 30 and 43 seconds per degree. Yeah, and that means our signal to be transmitted only goes up to 30 cycles per degree, but our sampling must be designed for 43 cycles per degree so that the eye cannot perceive the line or pixel grid. To avoid visibility of pixels here. Yeah, and the safety distance results in a factor which specifies the higher sampling, a higher sampling frequency than is actually required um, by the Nyquist theorem. By the Nyquist. Yeah, and for analog TV, analog TV, for the rows, this is where it first appeared, right? The rows are also sampling, like you sample the rows. Um, so that, that was actually something people took care of in the, I think in the 1930s, when they designed the television systems. So in this case, we need more samples or pixels in an image than twice the maximum spatial frequency in an image. Um, so those periodic black and white lines. In our case, the factor is 43 divided by 30. 
So here we can see 43 was the end of the transition band, 30 was the end of our pass band, and this factor is 1.4. Right? So we need to sample at a factor 1.4 higher than our signal would require. And the inverse, the reciprocal, is the so-called cat factor, which is about 0.7. And that means basically the image frequencies have to be lower by a factor of 0.7 than what Nyquist would say. Yeah, so this indicates that the number of lines in a captured image can only be smaller by a factor of a given line number in the recording device in order to avoid artifacts. For instance, areas where lines can be seen alternated with um, evenly gray areas you will get um, more ray if you ignore this factor. Okay. Yeah, so that's the reciprocal of the Kiel factor is roughly a factor to get from the upper limit of the pass bench to the lower limit of the stop bench in our transfer function. Yeah, and this was um, done experimentally. So experiments were necessary and um, they were actually carried out in the early years of television, among others from Cal. That's why this is called the Cal factor. So this is an example for analog television. Um, so they defined an image format, the aspect ratio of 3 to 4. So they have this even format because it needed to be as round as possible because the cathode, cathode ray tubes could only be built in this format to reason in reason, at reasonable prices. Right? So the first TVs were really round, like radar scale. And later they became less round and more rectangular. But this is still from this um, age where um, they need to be not too far from the brown shape, so the three to four. And they decided on a viewing distance of five times the diagonal. Right. So this is also kind of big when you think about it. When you think about computer screens, then yeah, how far are you from the computer screen in terms of the diagonal? What do you guess? So how is your diagonal of your computer screen? Maybe 50 centimeters? How far are you from the screen? Maybe the same, no? maybe also 50, 60 centimeters. So in this case of a computer screen, it's actually one times the diagonal. So this shows you that this is a different assumption. Right? They really assumed that um, you place the TV in one end of the room, the living room, and then you sit on your couch or sofa on the other end of the living room. And that's how they came up with this five times the diagonal. Oh yeah, and they assumed uh, uh, the typical size of cathode ray tubes for TVs at that time. Right. So it was like, I don't know, also like 50, 60 centimeters at that time. So say if you're 50 centimeter and five times 50 centimeter is two meter 50, right? So it's a, yeah, maybe like a small living room. Right. So this is basically the assumption they made for the design of the system. So it's quite different from today, basically. Yeah, but it also sh uh, shows you that you need to make assumptions because you need to um, compute um, the spatial frequencies as a result of the resolution of the screen and the viewing distance. Right? The further away you are from the display, the higher the frequencies become, the spatial frequencies. So these assumptions 
are crucial and the results only hold true for those assumptions and that's something we have to keep in mind so when people change those assumptions when they have larger screens and maybe sitting closer then high definition TV became reasonable right? high definition TV assumes much closer viewing distance on the order of like maybe one to two times uh, that I die. Right? So that assumption might change by the habits of people and the sizes of the displays. Yeah, so here for instance what I just mentioned, 50 centimeter display and 2.5 meter distance um, basically conforms to this assumption of five times the die. And when you have a computer screen at a distance of about 50 centimeter, then this assumption would mean that you would get a diagonal of only 10 centimeter. Right? In that case, uh, the window for your standard, division, standard definition TV would have the size of the diagonal of only 10 centimeters. Right? And that's sometimes what you can see actually on your, on your TV, on your computer screen. When you, when you live stream from standard division, standard definition TV, that you have small screens because that fits to the resolution of um, analog TV. Yeah, so here we can actually compute the necessary number of rows um, for this case. So vertically, we just assume a length of one. Some unit length doesn't really matter what it is. A horizontal length accordingly of 1.33 for this aspect ratio. And that means we have a diagonal of 1.6 period and a distance of 5 times that, which is 8.3 period. And from that, you can calculate the angle. So for the angle, we just need to ratio, and that's why um, units don't matter, they would cancel anyway. So what's the angle? Here I have this little triangle where we can compute the angle. So on the left hand side we have the screen, so that has the length 1. Then we have B, which is 8.3 period, this is the viewing distance. And then we want to know the angle alpha, and at the peak here of this triangle is the I, right? 5 times viewing distance. And you can see if we half this triangle, we get a rectangular triangle. And for rectangular triangles, we can use trigonometric functions like the tangents. And yeah, we know that the tangents of this angle here gives us um, yeah, A divided by B. Right? That's the definition of the tangents. And we know B is 8.3 period, and we know that um, A is 0.5 because it's half the height of the display, so it's 0.5. And we know this number, 0.5 divided by 8.3 period is 0.06. So now we just need to apply the inverse tangents to, each, uh, to both sides, and we get the alpha over 2. The arc tangents of 0.06 is 3.43 degrees, and this is half of our angle, so we just need to multiply by 2, and then we have the angle at 6.87 degrees. Make sense? So that means this is um, the angle at which we see the height of our, of our TV screen. So it appear, appears at an angle of 6.87 and we need the height because that's where the lines appear right? we subdivide the height by the lines or the rows of our analog TV remember the analog TV has one row after the other right? are you familiar with this? so analog TV displays one row after the other And we basically subdivide the height of our TV screen by the number of rows or lines. 
Yeah. So here we have the degrees, and that means now we can calculate the periods per degree. Right? So the first part is already done. So the upper limit of the pass band of the eye is about 30 cycles per degree. And that means if we have 6.87 degrees, this results in 30 cycles per degree. And times 687 degree leaves us with the circuit cycles. So then we come to 206 cycles. Right. So this is the upper end of the pass band. So this is what the eye could still see. So the eye could still resolve 206 dark bright cycles horizontally on the screen or displayed on your rows. So you have dark and bright rows. Yeah, but in order to avoid artifacts and this highest frequent, high spatial frequency, we need to uh, take the safety distance into account. So we must um, divide by the can factor. <clears throat> so this then results in 294 cycles per degree, which must the screen which the screen must be able to display. So this is basically our Nyquist frequency then. So that means we need twice that many rows, right? So the rows, the number of rows is our sampling frequency, and hence we get this factor of two. So you could say one row is dark, one row is bright, one after the other. That's the um, that's what you need uh, for displaying 294 periods, 588 rows, because each period needs one dark and one bright. Makes sense? Yeah. So this is our estimation, and for comparison. In Europe, we have 625 lines in the TV standard, and in the US, we have 525 lines in the standard. So both are around this value. So actually, this fits. Right? And here in Europe, we have more lines because um, the frame frequency is lower. So we have more time to generate the image. In the US, we have 60 hertz instead of 50 hertz, so that is connected to the frame rate. So that means they have less time to create one frame, and that means they have a few less lines. Yeah, but in general, this shows a good correspondence, and this shows how they came up with those numbers. Yeah, so. Came, we came from the transmission function of the eye for local for spatial frequencies. transfer function shows it shows you that the transfer function of the eye, the contrast sensitivity function, is a powerful tool. Right? Because you can design systems for video for the eye. Yeah, does it make sense so far? So this shows an application of the contrast sensitivity. So, 
quality measurement is then also related to what the eye can see and what's important to the eye. Right? You can measure the quality of an image. So you just look at the difference between the reconstructed and the original and square, square each difference and take the average. And that is a quality measure. But that doesn't take into account what the eye finds important and what not. Right? And that these can be very different things as shown in this example. So here we have six images. The first is the original and the other all contain changes. And we now measure the mean squared error for each of those um, distorted images. And actually these distortions are made that they all have the same mean squared error. Right, again, mean squared error is means, it means you just take the difference between distorted and original, you get an error value at each pixel, square all those values to avoid negative numbers, and then you take the average over all those numbers, and that's your mean squared error. Right? It can also be seen as uh, um, average error power, power because you do the squaring. Yeah. So how do those pixels or those images look like? Can you see the differences? And you can zoom in a little bit. So the first is the original. How do you th what do you think about B? Does it look good? Can you see the difference to the original? Is there a difference to the original? <coughs> Yes. Like what? More bright. Yeah, it looks a little more bright, right? No. What about C? Does it look different from the original? In what sense? Hard to tell. Somewhat different, but it's hard to tell. And if you wouldn't have the original, we wouldn't even we couldn't even tell that it's a degraded image, right? So what about this one here? You can clearly see that it's distorted, right? Those typical ones. Yeah, you have those typical blocking artifacts from compression, right? Like when you compress too much using JPEG. This is what you get. And you could even tell that it's distorted without seeing the original. Right? Because it's unnatural. What about this one here? It's blurred. Yeah, it's blurred. Again, you can easily tell, even if you don't have the original, that this is bad quality. Right? What about this one here? Can you see the distortion? Yeah, you have little dots, right? You have white dots and then some black dots. So some pixels are totally wrong in this in this picture. And again, this is something you could even tell if you don't know the original. Except maybe somebody had confetti. Maybe, maybe for confetti this would be a natural image. Yeah, so when you when you take these images and com compute the mean square error, they would all have the same mean square error. But obviously they have quite different qualities. Right? So this shows us that the mean square error, which has the advantage that it's very simple to compute, is not a good predictor for the image quality. Right? So if you want to actually measure the quality of an image using some numerical method, um, then we have to come up with something um, more powerful. So, yeah, so here is a description of what we just saw. So they all have the mean square error of 10, 210. And um, 
Now B is a contrast stretched image, so it has a larger contrast. And now you see MS sim, which is this is actually a measure that um, they introduced here in this paper, from which this um, picture is. They came up with a quality measure, which is um, better in predicting the quality of the images. And here you can see it actually has the high value, meaning good quality. Then the next is the mean shifted version. Again, a high value for MSM. Then JPEG, indeed. And it has an MSM of only 0.69, so it's correctly predicting a lower quality. Then the a blurred image has only 0.7, and then the salt and pepper only has 0.7. So it shows that this uh, quality measure is doing indeed a much better job than um, the mean squared error. Yeah, so I have it here from this paper here. But I guess now the time is up. So thanks for your attention and have a nice afternoon.